Today is a really special day. My conservation pilgrimage has brought me to the Brevard Zoo in Melbourne, Florida to pay homage to a tiny little creature who has caused hundreds of developers to halt in their tracks and has garnished millions of dollars in conservation efforts to make sure that their existence continues. How can such a small creature demand so much respect from humans? Well, y'all follow me. We'll meet someone special who can give us the answers. Hey, Molly. Oh, hey, Micah. Good to finally meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks for meeting me out here. I appreciate you inviting me out to your field site. And oh. I can tell wind or rain you're out here doing field work. Absolutely. The mice don't mind. So what do you do as a conservation coordinator? So this is actually part of one of my jobs as a conservation coordinator. I'm doing some field study work for the beach mice that we work with. Well, while we're here, show me some of the tools of your trade. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm setting up a tracking tube. So we have this uh, piece of PVC, and I'm gonna open this elbow here and set it up with its uh, print card. So I put that print card in all the way to the back. And I've got some yummy sunflower seeds I'm going to sprinkle in the back here. And in the very front, I know it's hard to see, uh, I've got some, I'm wearing some of my supplies already, uh, but I have this ink pad that I'm going to go ahead and stick in the very front. That ink pad is right there in the front. The seeds are all the way at the back to entice them to go in and over. It's uh, animal safe ink, so we don't have to worry about that affecting the mice at all. And they will crawl up this dowel go across, get their seed, and come on back. Now, we do get a few different species, but um, our experts are trained to be able to tell uh, the species of mouse just by the size of the footprint, which is really impressive. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in right here. So that's that. And, and I'm just rodents are going to be able to get up in there? Correct, just rodents. We will have other visitors that might be interested, like skunk or raccoon, but they won't be able to get up and in there. Um, and then right here, I don't know if you can see this, I started setting this up. This is one of our actual physical traps. Uh, I don't know if you remember the have a heart traps, but um, it's just to contain the mouse for a brief period of time. Um, so it's actually called a Sherman trap and we outfit it with a little nestlet and some more seeds back there. And there's a little lever that if, I don't know if you heard that noise, but that was the front door shutting. So I set it like that. I make sure it's gonna be sensitive enough for a 12 gram mouse. That looks good. So it's gonna be like that. And I'm actually gonna set it over here in this excluder device. So I put it in there, I'm gonna clip it off. And then I have the shade cloth because we are in Florida, so it does tend to get warm during the day. Now these guys are nocturnal. They're not gonna come out until the nighttime, but we don't want that trap heating up during the day. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna leave that for a few hours and then we'll come back and see what we have uh, later in the evening. For now, let's go over to the zoo and see what we can find. Let's do it. I'm dying to see him. All right, let's Perdido go. Perdido Beach Mouse in person. Yes. While most rodents around the world are treated as vermin, Molly works hard to create a pampering refuge of serenity and good vibes in the hope that it'll put these mice in the mood to make babies. So here we have four female Perdido Key beach mice. Hi, I'm talking to, oh, bye. Okay, these guys really are a keystone species. So they actually live in the dunes on beaches. So they go down there, they make their nests, and when they make those tunnels, it, um, the roots come down from the grasses and it aerates those roots and it kind of solidifies them and makes them um, stronger and grow taller. And then these guys are rodents, so they do cache their food. So they'll take a bunch of seed down. If they find a really good patch of something yummy, they'll take a lot of it down into their nest, and then they won't eat it all because they either forget about it or they find something even yummier. Um, and then those seeds will eventually grow up to be new grasses. So they're actually helping the dunes get stronger helping the grasses grow, helping make more grasses um, and other plants. And these guys actually love eating insects, so they're a natural pesticide too, which is super cool. So I am just amazed that something so small can play such a big role. Actually, I don't know if you can see back there, but we do have a snake skin hanging out of that, that log. Yeah, and what's really cool is I have seen them do it. What they do is they will go up to the snake skin, 
start to chew it, get it in their mouths, and then groom themselves. So it's almost like they want to get that scent on them. So when they go back in their burrow, when they go back to their home, if another type of predator comes by, they might smell and say, oh, there's a snake in there. I'm not going in there. Wow. So it's pretty awesome. And they'll also rip off pieces and use it in their nesting for bedding. So what would happen to the Perdido beach mouse if there weren't people like you in your position taking care of them? breeding them and, and whatnot. A hurricane was headed straight for Perdido Key and a biologist thought, wait a minute, we have these mice. If that hurricane comes and wipes over their habitat, you know, normally an instinct would have them go back to the secondary dunes or a little bit further in They're They're very sensitive to barometric pressure. Um, they would sense that and say, okay, we gotta come, we gotta move back until that um, surge is done and go back. But it's so developed that they really have nowhere to retreat to. So the biologist said, wow, we have to, we gotta see if we can get a handful of these guys because if they, if the majority of them get wiped out, we need to be able to put them back to continue to do their work, to help keep the dunes healthy, to help protect the land behind it. If that decision wasn't made, we probably would not have a Burdito Key beach mouse. Is there a breeding and release program? There is. Um, our, last, our last release was actually uh, back in 2010, and since that release, the numbers have done so well that all we've been needing to do is monitor. Wow, uh, some serious science. Yeah. And it sounds like it takes a lot of cooperation <laughs> yes. to, to get these yes. guys rebounded. A lot of really awesome relationships, for sure. So give them some salt spray. Um, it's really fun to watch in the night video, them go around and licking the salt off the leaves and just kind of getting that extra sensory uh, enrichment. What do you think? Does anybody want one? Oh, yum. Oops, oops, that's okay. You can have two because you're very cute. Where are you going? Come up here. Looks like she's trying to drop a few uh, grams before we actually get our weight here. She's thank you very much. Weight. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are probably one of, I don't even know, a handful of people that will ever be that close this to This is an honor. Mouse. Yeah. <laughs> the, the moment's not lost on me. Trust me. <laughs> she even left you some souvenirs if you would like them. Oh, I can take one home. You sure show. can. After excitingly collecting my pouvenir, I wanted to see how one cares for the world's most valuable mouse. I noticed uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, they don't they don't get enrichment, they get kind words. Yes, which are, I feel like. Is a, what are some of the kind words you tell, um, how do you compliment a mouse? Well, I would say, wow, your coat looks so beautiful today. Um, they would most likely be sleeping, so maybe I'd come in and play a little bit of music for them. I do do that occasionally. Um, we um, give them a white noise machine, so it feels like they're at the beach, so that would be another form of just joy for them, I would say, which was very special. So she made some artwork for us. Um, we crushed up some raspberries and blackberries and the juice, I strained the juice out, had her walk through it. And then she loved running on her wheel. So I taped a piece of paper to the wheel and then she used her little um, fruit paws and ran around and She's made this, made this, this piece like of art. Yeah. art very it's abstract. abstract. Um, you know, a lot of people don't get famous until they've passed, and I feel like that will continue to be the case for Cranberry. I love it. Yeah. And then I also heard you're into poetry, so I'd love to. Oh, I cannot. Have you recount this. Poem I sure at all. can. Um, this is really cool because it kind of takes the story of the beach mouse and compresses it and just puts it into this nice, neat package. So this is the mouse that builds the house, that nurtures the plants, that anchor the dune that weakens the storm, that could flatten the house that you live in. It gets extreme really fast. Beautiful. Um, thank you. But yeah, it's true. You can kind of see an example of what a beach mouse burrow looks like. Um, you can see the two uh, entrance exits here. So they'll have the one primary, their nest, and then sort of an escape hatch if they feel threatened um, from one side, they can shoot out the other. Um, but this really showcases the root system and a little example of the cached seeds and then their nest here. Um, this one's mostly coconut fibers, which is really neat. We do give them coconut fibers to nest um, here as well. And then 
this is actually a little bit bigger than a beach mouse would be, but I like to leave them up here because it startles people sometimes. It might sound odd, but I felt a sense of wonder getting to actually hold a nest made by an endangered animal. While the Brevard Zoo is certainly made famous by their sand-dwelling superstars, there were other conservation programs I was curious to see. En route to one of them, I was momentarily distracted by this gorgeous little spike ball who was putting on a good show. All right, so here's an example of some of the work we do with our um, Restore Our Shores team um, side of the conservation. So these are our oyster bags. Um, so you might notice that these are just all empty shell. What's really cool about these shells is that they actually came from restaurants. So we have a program called Shuck and Share, and once a week we go around to the participating restaurants and we collect all the discarded oyster shell from their uh, people that have come in and enjoyed some delicious oysters. So instead of those oysters just getting thrown into a dumpster, we are able to give them life again and we take them off site, we quarantine them, let them bake in the sun, and then we put them in these bags and we're actually able to create artificial reefs with them. So we take them out and we zip tie them together um, for whatever length, um, we put them on people's personal properties if they wanna participate in this, which is uh, a super cool program. And what happens is, these oysters, when they're little babies, they're a little spat and they just float around and they'll see these oyster shells and think, hey, that must be a good place to settle down oysters were here or maybe are still here, I think I'll come down and settle on these oysters. So they create their own oyster reef just by being blank shell on the bottom of the lagoon. So you'll have these displays laid out for people to come interact with? Yes, with exactly. The so the, involved with. the kids can come in, they can actually make their own oyster bag, which is really neat. And that's truly going to go right out to the lagoon and it's going to um, help new oyster growth to get oysters back in the wild. I'm glad we can take a moment to just chill with the kangaroos. Me too. I think they're my spirit animal, especially that one. <laughs> That's fast asleep. My spirit animal is a raccoon, so less chill animal. A little bit more garbage involved in that one. Trash pandas. Nice. Was there a moment you can trace back to that you really remember first? This is, you wanted to be, work with animals and, and be involved in this kind of work? Um, yeah, I think, so I got certified to dive when I was 12, and our first open water dive, we went out and we saw a Goliath grouper, which was bigger than I was, and right then, that in my brain, it was like this. I need to be around this all the time. It made me pretty dang jealous that when she wants to take a break from doing art projects with doe-eyed dune mice, she gets to wander the zoo, enabling her to have creative inspirations like Zoogle. Google reviews for zoo animals, which is still waiting to catch on. Well, Molly, you do such amazing work here. I know that there's going to be younger versions of you who are watching this and want to follow in your footsteps one day. So what did you do in your life that you think contributed to the position that you're in now? Um, I would say the biggest thing is volunteering and internships. I had an internship um, when I was in college for the New England Aquarium. Probably one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. You get to try out uh, so many different things and then you really get to work with professionals who are passionate in their field and kind of get a sense of where you might want to end up. So I would say take every volunteering opportunity, take every internship you're offered, go for something different and always try to be learning something new and you will be very satisfied. Well, that's such great advice, and I'm glad you're in the position you are doing the work that you do. Me so. too, me too. I actually, um, I have some honey here from our hives that I'm gonna get over to our sea turtles or doing some treatments. So I'm gonna break away and get that to them, but um, I had a lot of fun today, so thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it, and take care of those little mice. I will, for sure. Bye. As my conservation pilgrimage came to a close, I reflected on the lessons learned from my time with Molly and her mice. One person or animal really can make a difference in this world. So the next time you are feeling small and insignificant, remember the tiny beach mouse who just by being themselves have stopped powerful developers in their tracks and are the glue holding together a fragile ecosystem that so many others depend on.